This is a bolt of electricity that goes through the front of your body and comes shooting out the back, knocking most of your insides into the air. It's a big, bloody effect, but with lightning instead of a bullet. So I just finished Star Wars, and actually I'd finished uh, Empire, and so ILM had had a lot of experience and was really pretty much together in terms of doing special effects. So we had this great facility at our disposal on Indiana Jones to use to uh, create a, uh, a great environment and make the thing very exciting. It wasn't as special effects heavy as the Star Wars films were, but the special effects were just as important in terms of developing the milieu and the story and keeping the action going and making it very suspenseful. And designing how these special effects would work and how they would have to be laid down in order to come out with the, the finished product was done in a combination between Stephen, George, and everybody at ILM, led by Richard Edlins, our special effects uh, supervisor. We've been doing some experimental uh, set work, you know, mm -hmm. miniature. I don't know whether they've, they've brought any of that over. No, not yet. Yeah, well, it's, okay. it's not quite successful yet, but yeah. I think they can make it work. And then working with the mechanical effects with Kit West, it's a lot of coordination and collaboration here between several different departments to get the final shot. And the whole sequence, the climactic sequence in the movie, was very special effects oriented. And Stephen had this very visual idea about these tendrils going through and, and what would happen when they would hit a body. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that's moving around too much, you see? You just want to do that, but in the same place. We go on the count, ready? One! Two, three. We shot the long shots, basically. And then all the close-ups you see of them being wrapped by ghosts and things like that were shot at ILM. And uh, when the beautiful angel comes up towards camera, that was shot with this model made up with lots of diffusion and material on the lens to make her look kind of fuzzy without being out of focus. And we shot in a water tank to make the veil float and the ghosts, you know, they were actually real little miniature ghosts, you know, with cloth and everything, but they shot them underwater in slow motion so that they would put them on little sticks and they'd sort of fly them around in this little windowed pool of water against a black background. And that gave them this kind of surreal, floaty feel. And that was, I think, one of the best effects uh, besides the heads blowing up and that sort of thing, which was relatively more traditional. Tote, which is the most spectacular, you know, because he was the Nazi you loved to hate. Here's his head, as a matter of fact. So uh, this, is, this is what's left. And basically, this skull, we sculpted the muscles and the different layers of, of what would actually be in the face out of this dental alginate, the thing, the stuff that the dentist uses to take molds of your teeth. And then it was sculpted to look exactly like Tote. And using the heat lamp, and by, by putting heat on this alginate, it naturally melts. And by shooting at one frame a second, it appears to melt, but you don't see all the drops because they fall off and, and, and they're a blur. Then Wolf's face, basically it was hollow, and then he just sucked the air out of it. And the exploding head was covered over by a large pillar of fire because the ratings board gave us an R based on the exploding head. So we had to negotiate for a PG rating by um, putting a large column of flame double exposed in front of the actual graphicness of the head coming apart. On Raiders of the Lost Ark, I was uh, involved only at the very beginning doing some tests about the, for doing the ghost sequence, but I did end up doing a little bit part in the movie. On Temple of Doom, I was uh, the effects supervisor here at ILM, and we had a lot of sequences. We had the big uh, mine chase sequence, going through the tunnels. Um, there was a great tunnel set that had been built full size that they could get quite a few shots off of. But when the camera pulled back and needed to see a lot of distance, I and mean, we came in with our model work. We had some script pages that basically described what, you know, Stephen had in mind. And then Stephen invited us to come up with gags, basically, things that could happen. For instance, going over the lava flow and, you know, the ski jump. But as soon as we got storyboard pages from Stephen. We built little sets using butcher paper and you know, railroad cars and took a video camera and shot a version of the sequence using this little video camera in this funky set just to see if it was going to play. 
And on the basis of that, Stephen was able to eliminate certain gags that he didn't think were necessarily going to pay off and, and accept other ones. The budget on that film was fairly tight. We didn't have unlimited amount of money by any means. So the construction cost to build our miniature sets of the mine tunnels and everything, I figured out was actually based on how big the camera was. And so what they did is they rigged a regular camera, regular still camera with a, with a motor on it. And taking the, the back out of the Nikon camera that pulls the film tight and put a movie uh, shuttle in there and run movie film through it instead of still film. And this little camera was on a little a uh, mine car just like the other one, I and mean, then one would follow right after the other. And it worked great. And that meant because the camera now was only this big, our mine tunnels only needed to be this big, like a foot across, and we could actually make them out of aluminum foil. So we just bought a lot of aluminum foil, crunkled it up to look like a mine tunnel, painted it to look like rock, and for you know $1.98, we got uh, some great sets. And to then move the camera at a fast speed, we had to shoot really at a very slow speed. The camera was shooting one frame of film a second, so it was going very slowly along there. And that was fine for all the views looking ahead and looking back where nothing's going on. But there were scenes when you actually saw the characters that had to move. And those characters in there were then animated by Tom Sandemann using stop motion animation. So eventually the scene gets built up when you see it all together, it looked like continuous motion of a mind car. When they get lower down into the pit, we build a half-size model of Kate Capshaw and a half-size one of the slave, probably about three feet long or so, and then put them in a half-size model of the cage, and then had that actually lower down into our pretend lava. Cut. Cut in. Okay, let's do another. Let's play one right away. There were a lot of map paintings in this movie. There's one that we have near the end when the heroes are walking and you see a massive, beautiful city out there. The heroes are actually double shot here in Marin, put into the painting, and coming out in the cliff face and the water suddenly starts pouring out. Some of that is a very large miniature we built, and then painting to go way off in the distance. That was quite an elaborate set we built also. We had a miniature tank, probably about 20 feet in the air, full of probably 5,000 gallons of water, and the cliff face that we had made and just had the water come from behind, pouring out of this thing, and then shot it at high speed so it looked like it was uh, bigger than it really was. Well, Last Crusade was another huge jump in responsibility for me because uh, basically I was the supervisor for the whole film and I was pretty green, I was just a kid and uh, you know that was a challenge. And can we just pull the plane through by itself without the fire please? In those days there was no such thing as digital fire so if you had a sequence, especially a miniature sequence that involved fire, you pretty much were limited to actually shooting it as a miniature set. And, and that's indeed what we did. We had a miniature plane and we had miniature tunnels. And that was actually a pretty huge engineering feat to figure out you know, how to build the equipment to get the camera and the plane through the tunnel and, and get all the timing correct so that it exploded at the right place so you had a shot. But at the same time, we have to really sell the idea that he's actually walked off the cliff and he's standing in the middle of the thing. Well, look, let's just extend the cliff out to here. That was the single most challenging concept in the movie, is how to actually tell that story that there's a bridge there, but you can't see it. It was sort of like the buck just got thrown to us and big smiles in everybody's faces because nobody else really knew how to do it. <laughs> And uh, it was a combination of matte painting type of talent on a miniature set. 
And so we built the set with the clips and everything, and we built a physical bridge that spanned the gap. And then from a certain camera position, Paul Houston would look through the camera, and he would literally paint the bridge so that it blended into the background and was essentially invisible. And Paul's ability to create photoreal paintings that would hold up on the screen was really exceptional. And that was one of the most interesting things ILM did, because you had to show the audience what it was. You know, when it, everything lines up, there's nothing there. But when you start moving the camera to the right, we show the audience, just in one shot, illustrate to them that there was always a rock bridge to be crossed. What are we doing today? We're doing, we're doing all, the, all the skin falling off and we're doing that, right? Good. Well, what you want? Basically, the assignment was to take a healthy man and turn him into dust in one shot. And um, the way that we went about doing that was to create three different puppets in different stages of decay, knowing that we could eventually morph the three puppets together. And then for the final skin decay, pasted all these little pieces of this shrinkable plastic onto the puppet and then basically shoot in time-lapse photography and blow hot air at it. And so that became the foundation of all the skin decaying and falling off and looking horrific. You know, I think a lot of the work we did then, or certainly all the work we did then, was before computers. And so you never had a chance to really fix the last two or three little things that that didn't work because you were always just trying to get anything that was close to, to working. One of the reasons that, that the visual effects in this trilogy really hold up today is that the trilogy itself holds up. It's not, it's not a time-dependent story, and it's an adventure that just you know, captures people's imaginations no matter what generation you're from. And the visual effects really fit into the overall design and the overall idea of those stories.